welcome you to this inaugural lecture by Unix. It's titled Life Cycle Assessment, Getting the Results Right and Why the Intuitively Right is Often Wrong. Looking forward to hear more about that. So we are very happy today to celebrate Yannick's new professorship with the Danish Center for Environmental Assessment. And I will come back later and say some more about that. But for now, I'll just leave the word to you, Yannick. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot, Anna. Well, I would also like to say welcome to all of you. Nice to see all you guys here. Welcome to this professorial inaugural lecture. So first, you could ask, what is an inaugural lecture? It's an uh, opportunity to uh, tell what I'm doing. Uh, and it's an opportunity you often use uh, when you are promoted as a professor. So that's what I want to do now. I've put together a small agenda here. Uh, first of all, I will say something about what is the problem. Albor University is known for problem-based learning. So I will start with problem like we always do here. Next, I will give you a super short crash course in life cycle assessment because that's the topic of the lecture. And not all of you may be 100% up to date on all the newest stuff within LTA. Secondly, or thirdly, uh, I will tell about intuitively right, but maybe not correct. Uh, I'll tell you some stories from the jungle in Malaysia, Indonesia. I'll tell you about soybean meal, land use changes, and maybe some organic farming as well. I also have some other stories. They are about LTA guidelines, and that's also about intuitively right and maybe not always correct. And then my one of my last bullets here, it's about if we were not right, we will see during the stories, but how do we then get the results right? And finally, I'll say a few concluding. Well, the audience for such an inaugural lecture, is that for everyone? Maybe, let's see. I've tried to do my best. Uh, I've tried to graduate the way that I speak. So I've put together some stuff, which is what I refer to it as level one. That should be for everyone. Then sometimes it would get a bit more difficult. We have a level two. So there a few of you may say, OK, let's have a look out of the window instead. There's also a level three. Then it's getting really hard and barely no one of you will be able to understand what I'm talking about. And finally, I have my my last level. I'm, I'm the only one who will be able to understand anything. Better. Great, but let's get started. What is the problem? Well, we have a problem, and that's in the upper corner here. Uh, the problem is that we are facing an increasing temperature. That is at least one of the problems that will be the main problem I'm referring to today. But according to the newest reports from the IPCC, the temperature is forecasted to increase between one and a half and five degrees within the neck, within this century. Uh, why is that a problem? Well, I'll come back to that. This problem is caused by greenhouse gases. And what we see here, that's the development of greenhouse gas emissions since the 90s and then up to almost today. And we see that it has a nice increasing slope. Uh, you also see that there's a number of different greenhouse gases here. There's some CO2 from fossil sources. That's when you took your car here. Then we have CO2 from land use changes. That's when you're drinking your coffee. Uh, then we have methane emissions from livestock landfill sites, and we have some nitrous oxides, mainly from uh, fertilizer use in agriculture and some minor other stuff we don't need to talk about today. Okay, so how is it going? If we are implementing the current, or if we just stick to the current policies we have today, we will see that we are not able to stop in emissions. Actually, they just slightly increased today. That will mean that uh, the forecasted temperature increases will go well beyond the five degrees. So then we will reach seven degrees plus compared to where we are today. So that's not so good. If we want to stick with the lower scenarios you see in the top here, we can, uh, a, it's often referred to as if we are going to reach only a two degrees temperature increase, 
then we need to reduce by 70% here. And if we want to reach the goal, which is the most common accepted goal, uh, within the Paris Agreement, we should go down to 1.5 degrees. Here we need to reduce by 83%. So we have quite a task in front of us, especially looking at current policies. So that's the problem. Of course, this is only a problem along the pathway. So who cares about a little warmer weather? Basically, I like it. I My March uh, temperature is 28 to 33, so I can easily handle a more, few more degrees. But of course, there are also impacts when we, ha when we are facing uh, increasing temperatures. So a guy like this one here, uh, he will definitely not survive because the rainforests, they are vulnerable and they are prone to forest fires. Uh, increasing temperatures comes with droughts and we will see increasing uh, forest fires. That's just one among others. I guess all of you know what happened not only in Europe, but throughout the world this summer. Weather is simply going crazy. So we have a problem and the outlook is kind of, well, depending on where we go, it can be good or maybe not so good. So let's see, how do we get a solution? So before we get to a solution, I need to give you a short crash course. And that's about life cycle assessment. And that's what I'm working with since I did my first LCA in 97, and then I have not been doing anything else since then. So what is an LCA? An LCA, it's a calculation of impacts in a product's life cycle. So an example could be car driving. Maybe some of you have gone here by car, and you would like to know what is the environmental impact from driving one person one kilometer. That's the stuff I'm doing in my daily life. So if you're doing that, you would emit 106 grams of CO2 from the car. But of course, you also need some fuel for that. And that's where the life cycle comes into the picture. So we need to include a lot of different stuff. That's what I have prepared for by the gray shaded area. Inside here is what we call the system boundary. And that's where we have put the entire economy of the world. Outside is the environment. That's what we are caring about. So we are looking a bit upstream here. We need to extract some oil and refine some oil. That gives us 17 grams of CO2 per, again, this functional unit of one person kilometer. Then we also need to have the cars produced here. Uh, that needs some material that emits some CO2 emissions. When we are done with the car, after end of life, we send it to treatment here. Something is recycled and we can reuse some of the materials. So we may uh, avoid some material production if we recover the materials here and the rest may go to landfill down here. And then we can sum up all the emissions and we have what we call the life cycle emissions. That was part one of the crash course here. So what do we then use that for? Of course, we cannot have a such a nice tool without a purpose. What we can use it for is to analyze various scenarios and we can enlighten proportions. So imagine we have this car, if that was our only problem, then we could investigate, okay, can we do something about the fuel economy with the cars? Can we do something about biofuels? Can we do something about the number of passengers? Or we could make the car out of eco-friendly materials. We could use electric cars. So as you see here, there are many solutions. Some of them may be non-solutions. And at the same time, there will also be huge interests at stake. So here we have the starting point. That was the average, it's a diesel car, this one here. Uh, I have assumed 1.5 passenger per car as an average. And it runs 15 kilometer per liter. Then we can try to, and that was our standard result, we can try to do something with the fuel economy. So if we drive a bit longer per liter, we can reduce by a little few percentages. We can also try to use biofuel. Oops, then the results, they tend to increase here. That was maybe not a good idea. We can try to have either less passengers. That's not a good idea. Many passengers in one car. That was a good idea. We can try to make the car out of eco-materials. 
that did not give a lot, or we could even try to make it out of worse materials. That was not a good idea. Yeah. There's not a big, big difference here. And finally, we could try to make electric cars. So what you see here is that we can investigate a lot of different scenarios and web pathways how to solve how to find a solution to our problems. So that is what LCA can. It can help us with the proportions. So if you want to solve the problems with cars, I would not look too much into materials. I would tend to look somewhere over here about electric cars. You could also be thinking of putting more people in every vehicle here. That's also something that could help and have more economic cars over here. So that can help us guide where to find the right solutions. And I mentioned this bio view here. How can that be? And that's the starting point of the stories I'm going to tell now. So that's where we have something that could be intuitively right, but maybe not always wrong. When I started my PhD, that was back in 2004, as far as I remember. Uh, that was actually also where I got my coffee cup. It has a nice picture of an oil palm. So my topic of my PhD was an LCA applied to palm oil and rapeseed oil. And I've been working within this topic ever since. So that's also why I want to talk about biodiesel, because that's made of palm oil and rapeseed oil. And it all links together with soybean as well. So there are land use changes, deforestation, rango tanks. So there's a lot of things to talk about here. So let's jump into some of these uh, stories. OK. Uh, two years ago, there was a report published. Um, it was a study that was acquired by the Danish Ministry of Environment and Ministry of Food, Agriculture and Fisheries. And according to that report, it stated that the import of soybean and palm oil to Denmark, these two products alone, accounted for 7 million tons of CO2 equivalent. Then you can, of course, ask, is that a lot? Or is it peanuts? Or what is it? But here are a, oh, there should have been some proportions. They are up here. The proportions. Denmark's direct emissions, they are 44. So it's almost, what is that? Uh, something like 15, 18% of Danish uh, emissions. That's related only to the import here. That's quite a lot for these two smaller products. You can also see that palm and soil, they account for only 14% of the total feed and food consumption. So it's really two minor, minor products with major, major impacts. So we could first see what are we doing today? There's a lot of efforts on how to avoid soybean and palm oil. And there's also an increasing demand for deforestation free products. So is that a good idea? Yeah, I want to start with the first question. These 7 million ton of CO2 emissions, can that be correct? And these efforts we see up here, is that really something that can solve the problems? So let's have a look at the 7 million tons first. OK, this slide here is that imagine that you want to avoid problems. You are in your car and you can do two different things. You could look out of the front window. That's usually a good idea because then you can kind of avoid whatever happens. Or you can keep an eye on what is in the back of the mirror. So one of the methods used to calculate emissions, for example, these 7 million tons here, they have used an approach where they are consistently focusing on the back mirror. OK, how do they do that? They are looking at the crops today. That could be the oil palm and the soybean uh, crops we have here. And then they are looking what was on this, that piece of land 20 years ago. It could have been a forest. Then they are looking at, OK, 20 years ago, how much carbon was there on this plot of land? There was 160 ton of carbon per hectare because it was a nice rainforest. Then today there's only five because there's not a lot of carbon in the crops in the cropland. Then what they do, they multiply by 44 divided by 12, that's from carbon to CO2. Then they take the change in 
carbon stock, and then they divide by 20 because they are looking 20 years back in time. And voila, they have a 28 tons of CO2 per hectare. That's the calculation. It's super simple. But what is wrong here? The problem here is that the only thing that is included in this calculation here, that is forests that are already destroyed. So can we save these forests if we don't buy soil? They are already gone. OK, what is then excluded from this analysis here? That's all the forests we want to protect. OK, so that was we are consistently looking at the wrong place. So and how can we interpret the results of such a calculation here? The interpretation is that we can avoid deforestation 20 years ago with a ban on soybean. And that's obviously nonsense. It doesn't work. So how can we do it the right way? OK, then let's have another example. Now I would like one hectare of rapeseed cultivation. It could be three tons. That's an average yield of rapeseed. So if I am demanding these three tons of rapeseed, of course, I need to grow them somewhere. Otherwise, they will not be there. So let's put them somewhere. I put them here. OK, so I have to change this land here from something that was would have been there uh, if I did not put uh, the rapeseed. So that's what I'm calling direct land use changes. So that is what would have been there if there was not any rapeseed and rapeseed. So you can have the carbon stock change here. Usually that's a super small difference because if this one here is barley from wheat, this here is rapeseed, there's a basically a difference between the two. So usually we say these direct land use changes are zero. And what happened out here to the left? Well, if I am putting some rapeseed here, the other crops that would have been there, they are not being grown. So, and if they are not grown, people, they will not start using less of these crops, so they have to be grown somewhere else. So we need to compensate these crops that we are squeezing out of the system. Where can we compensate crops? It can be somewhere else. This is just a picture of the border between where we are seeing the rainforest and we have the rainforest. It's just Google Earth from Brazil somewhere. And then we can expand arable land there. And we can start cultivating something and we can compensate what we squeezed out from the rapeseed field. This is what we are calling indirect land use changes. We also have another lump of land we need to compensate here. How can we do that? We can add some more fertilizers somewhere in the system and we can increase the yields here. So we can actually get more uh, products out of the same land so that can also compensate some missing land. But that's the way we should model indirect land use changes. So after having presented this framework of modeling land use changes, then we could ask, can we solve the problem uh, of the impact of land use changes by growing protein crops in Denmark? Mm. If we were using the approach on the previous slide here by looking in the back mirror, then it's a good idea to grow protein crops in Denmark, because if we look 20 years back, there was still cropland in Denmark. So there is no impact if we grow our stuff in Denmark. But if we are then moving here to this framework here, it doesn't help to grow something in Denmark because we are still having an impact somewhere else in the system. So it's not necessarily a good idea to grow crops in Denmark. You could also demand deforestation-free products. Do they exist? Can you then ask? Well, usually you say something is deforestation-free or they say if you grow it on a plot of land that has not been deforested more than 10, 20, 30 years ago. But of course, that cannot solve the problem. That is only looking at the back mirror. So that will not solve the problem. And I will not tell a lot about uh, organic farming, but there's a lot of efforts towards organic farming. One of the issues with organic farming is that there's typically a much lower yield. So we need much more land for growing the same amount of crops. So Organic farming is not necessarily a good idea. There's definitely an issue with the land use related to organic farming. So there's a lot of intuitively right things about biofuels, organic farming, deforestation free products. That is not so obviously correct. It may be more tending to be wrong. 
could also ask, now there's so much about palm oil, it's such a bad guy. Should we put a ban on palm oil uh, in the EU? What would happen then? Well, I've been working with a company who have actually faced this because the EU is working towards such a ban, or at least discriminating palm oil. So what happened with this last palm oil producer? Well, they told me, sorry, we have to quit the collaboration because we are now focusing at India and China instead. Okay, I said. Then when they are moving the focus to these countries instead, there's not the same focus on environmental improvement as we have in the EU. So they have little incentives for making improvements or having a cleaner production system. So by doing that, there are huge potentials or opportunities for reducing emissions lost. Of course, if we put a ban on palm oil, we don't need to collaborate with someone who call them bad guys, and we can wash our hands. But however, if we are collaborating, we can also collaborate in improving systems. And let's have a look here. That's some charts from my work on vegetable oils. We see over here, that's non-certified palm oil. It has a fairly big impact. Then we have sunflower oil. Here we have certified palm oil, almost the same as sunflower oil, and also in almost the same as rapeseed oil you see here. And over here to the very right is a company I've been working with for several years. Actually, I own also as part of my PhD, where we call them best in class. And if you see here, if we compare, uh, let's have a look at the reduction potentials. So if we take the non-certified palm oil, what the EU can do by putting these requirements is reducing the impact on palm oil by 70% if they just go down to today's best in class. If the EU had the idea that we should use rapeseed, then still we can reduce by 50% compared to European rapeseed. So it may not be a very good idea to put a ban on palm oil. Why not collaborate and on reducing the impacts? That's a much better idea for the environment. Okay, that was my storytelling part one. Now I will jump to storytelling part two, and that's about LCA guidelines. So let's see what we can find out here. Before I will tell something about LCA guidelines, I need to tell you something about different types of LCA. And I think I have forgotten to tell you or keep you alert on which level are we at. Uh, here we are at the uh, high school level like this. I presented this slide here at a high school two weeks ago. So let's see if, uh, if it works here as well. Okay, there are two different ways of modeling in life cycle assessment. There is one over here, we call it consequential LCA. That's what I've been working with for the last 25 years. And then we have over here, another one called attributional LCA. Attributional LCA, that's where PEF, that's the European Product Environmental Footprint Guideline. I guess many of you also know the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, that's also attributional. Then we have the EURED, that's the Renewable Energy Directive, it's also attributional. We have the UK PAS 2050 and a lot of other uh, guidelines. Okay, so what is characterizing these two different approaches to LCA? If we first take a look here at consequential LCA, the focus here is to establish cause and effect relationships. So we can first say, okay, if we change our demand for product A here, what happens with producers here? And what happens with emissions in the, in the end? So we could try to put a change in demand here, that's a delta. And some of the producers here, they will say, okay, yes, we will produce more, and some will not. Because not all suppliers will change the production if I change the product. And then we will see that there will be some of them I will affect. That's where we have to bold arrows. And here's also one that is supplying a byproduct. But I'm not asking for the byproduct, I'm only asking for product A. And they are producing product B down here. So what happens? They put it, of course, into the market. They will not put it in the waste bin. When they put it in the market, there'll be other producers of this product. They will reduce their production. So the dotted line here means that 
this is substitute or displaced. Okay, let's have a look at the attributional approach over here. It's more a matter of looking at the product A here and not looking at what is the effect of buying this product. The exercise over here is more to tracing, usually backwards in time, and also tracking the mass and energy and economic flows through markets and identify average markets. And whenever there's a supplier that is producing more than one product, then so-called allocation is introduced. Allocation means that you multiply the emissions from this supplier here with a certain percentage between zero and 100. So you cut off some of the uh, emissions here. Uh, and then you say that the remaining part that belongs to product A that you're saying here. So that's the difference between the two. All right. I've touched upon two important things. One is these supply mixes. That was the supply mixes. They, uh, we call them marginal over here, this supply mix, and we call it average over here. The second one was the byproducts here. Okay. Then this allocation I was showing before, does that lead to wrong results? Well, there are some guidelines that require that you do allocation. The EU PEF guideline is, is one example. So one example could be that if you have a cow, out of this cow comes milk and meat. If you allocate it, then what happens is that you can have one cow like this, it is producing milk. And then you have the other cow, like this, this is producing meat. And then if I'm only demanding milk, then the system product system will look like this here. So we only have half a cow like this, and that is producing only milk. And these are the emissions we include. So what is, then you can ask, what is the difference between, what is the real impact of buying beef in Denmark? If I go to the supermarket, I buy beef, what is the real impact? Let's say that's 50 kilograms, that's not too often. Then instead, if I try to allocate this guy up here, the allocate, no, this one, the front end, the allocated cow, if I'm allocating a Danish making cow, then I would arrive at a result at around 19 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of beef I'm buying supermarket. So what is the problem here? Well, problem, I would not say it's wrong to allocate, but it just does not, it does not produce the results that you are often expecting. I would expect that if I go to the supermarket and I buy one kilogram of beef, then the calculated results I'm looking at, I would expect that that would be the amount of CO2 I could find additionally in the atmosphere if I buy it. And if I don't buy it, these emissions would not go in the atmosphere. So that's the logic I have. And that logic will mean that I will not affect any milking cows if I'm buying beef, because the milking farmers, they adjust their production according to the demand for milk. And then the beef farmers, they will adjust their production according to the demand for beef. That's how it works. Okay, then another question could be, this allocation stuff again, is that something that can lead to random results? Here, I have a real life example I've been working uh, with several rendering industries in Europe. And then let's put the cow upside down and let's try to see what happens with the cow when it's dead and not produced to uh, food. Then we send it to the rendering industry. And when we're doing that, it's processed into bone meal and fat for biodiesel. And the company I was in touch with here, they have two different machines. They have uh, one machine, first the cow goes in, it's surrounded, cooked, boiled, a lot of nice stuff. Uh, and then there is a so-called fat separation with a wet process, meaning that here is coming, here you take out the fat that can be used for biodiesel. And then after that, the rest, the remaining is uh, dried and then it can be sold as bone meal. That was the one machine, then the other machine here, then here they do the drying first, after the drying, they do the fat separation. So they have the same two products out here as the first machine. And they also have more or less the same energy input here. The second machine as the first machine. They are just doing it two different places. So 
Now I would like to know what is the impact of biodiesel from these two machines? Well, first, I think we can agree that these two machines here, well, maybe I will actually stop myself now because I'm already too much into allocation. So uh, before going too much into allocation, I want to find out what is actually the correct modeling here. What happens if I go into the market and I, I say, I would like some fat from dead animals because I want to make biodiesel. What is the impact? The correct in, uh, answer is that would be the marginal biodiesel, which could be palm oil. Because of course, if I buy this fat here, there will not be more dead cows in the market. Then I would need to go and kill a cow, and then I, I should kill a cow every time I demand some biodiesel. That's not the way it works. So the correct answer is nothing of this stuff here. <laughs> um, and why? I have just answered that because dead animals, they are constrained. That's not something that is, there are not more dead animals because we are demanding biodiesel. Okay, now let's go back to the allocation. So we are already far off, but we are far off in two different ways here. So we agreed that we have the same machine with the same energy, the same <laughs> two machines. They just have an energy input at different places uh, here. So let's have a look at the first machine. We do an allocation here because that's where the products they are spinning. So the impact of biodiesel here, that would be an allocated part of this process here, which does not use any energy. So it's a close to zero impact for this biodiesel here. Okay, then we look in the second machine. Here we do the separation here, so we need to allocate everything. So we will have some of the energy included, and we have some biodiesel with a high impact. And of course, here you see it's completely random. Uh, if you can allocate either here or here, just because you have two machines which can do exactly the same and you have completely different results. So this so-called point of allocation, it can lead to completely random results. So you can have two systems with the same overall impact and the point of allocation gives very different impacts. So of course that is not super ideal and, and there are problems about this here in the European PEF guide. Then you could ask a guideline such as the PEF guideline. If we have one guideline and everyone just agrees to use the same guideline, do we then have all of us, do we then have the same results? Then it could be nice. Then we can say, okay, there are a few errors, and there are a few random results, but we all calculate in the same way. So we have comparable results. Is that what we will have? Okay. I have just taken a look in the main document of the EU PEF guideline. There's a hierarchy of how to deal with these byproducts in line with the ISO standards. And basically they say you should do substitution. That's the highest priority. And then under the main document, there are a large number of sector specific documents. So there's a guideline for meat and there's a guideline for animal feed and a guideline for breweries and a guideline for many different sectors. And here you can see many different allocation rules. So now I want to look into a pig. That's what I've spent some time on for the last couple of years. Um, this pig here, uh, we need feed. So I want to know what is the impact of feed. And I want, in some countries, uh, they use a lot of byproducts for pig feed, especially in Sweden. So that's where I've been doing some LCAs of pigs. Uh, so I did a very, very thorough study of figs in Sweden, and they were eating all this byproduct feed here. Uh, I was using this PIF CR, that is the sector guidance uh, for animal feed, um, and this one it showed that I should use economic allocation. That's a screen dump from the guideline. And then a day, there was a colleague of mine who gave me a call to say, mm, your results, they are really, really different from uh, some, uh, some Swedish guys. They have made the same calculation, exact same calculation as you, but they have arrived at almost uh, half the impact. As you have done. I thought, okay, oh my God, have I made an error here. And then I was trying to investigate what was the cause of this error. I found out that the other study, the Swedish study, they have used another uh, guidance, sector guidance uh, for the modeling of feed. They were looking into guidance of uh, beer. 
And in that guidance, you can find that for the vaulting process, uh, you should put 100% of the impact of the beer if the co products are used for animal feed. So you have PEF here. You just need to choose the right document and you can reduce your impacts by 50%. And this is just one example. It's, of course, I, I don't have the time for telling all the examples. But the problem is that this poor guy, it doesn't really know how to uh, calculate its uh, impact if, if, the, uh, it, if its feet can have such different results. So I hope this, these stories, they made it clear that there's really a call for getting the results right. We cannot have random results. We cannot have misleading results. Of course, we also need data on all products because in the end, we need to change basically all aspects of our consumption and production. And the data, they need to be valid and calculated according, according to meaningful methods. But is that possible at all? Now, the, for instance, the EU PEF guideline work has been ongoing. Uh, the first publications, they were published in 2009, 2010. It's still ongoing. They have spent hundreds of millions of euros on this project. And still, we are facing problems, as I just mentioned. OK, I have some suggestions. A small example of getting data on every product and actually calculate according to meaningful guidelines. We did a small example. Uh, this small example is called the Big Climate Database. We did it together with the Danish NGO, Concito. It was a super small project, less than uh, a million kroner uh, from my side. And we calculated uh, impacts of 500 different uh, food items. And we were so lucky that we even got the uh, Nordic Council environmental prize for it. And that was just a small example. Uh, we are now implementing the same methods and approaches in a much larger project, project called getting the data right. And I will say a few words about that. So this project uh, is a project that started one and a half year ago. It's called Getting the Data Right. And basically the purpose of this project is to make a climate footprint calculator. We want, and, and the purpose is to get data on everything. There should be more than a thousand products. That was is what we have promised, but we want to do it for 2000 different products. And we want to do it for all countries in the world. I know there are more than 55 countries in the world, but the rest of the world is lumped together in some rest of world regions. The background of doing all this here is that we are building on top of more than 10 years of experience and work on databases. Uh, for large EU projects here, we have collaborated on a database called Exiobase, and that's the one we are really rebuilding and exploding to a much higher level of detail. It's here at Nova University, we have the lead. This project is funded by the KR Foundation, uh, and it has a total budget of 5.5 million euro. So the idea of this project here is that it should so make, solve the problems that the PEF is trying to solve. And we are going to do it in four and a half years and with maybe 1% of the budget as it is used on PEF until now. Let's see how it goes. I'll show some of the few things that we are working on in this project. Uh, some groundbreaking breaking, uh, research that brings us a step forward. And now we are, <laughs> sorry, uh, maybe at least I understand it. So that's uh, that's how it's going to work, this one here. Okay. Um, have you ever heard about supply use tables, input output models, consequential models, database construction? The starting point is national statistics and national statistics. It could be Danish national statistics. They have statistics on how much products is supplied by every industry in the economy. So we could have every industry in the economy here. That could be Danish industries. This small part here, this small part here. If you imagine there are columns down, it's a big table, and there are columns down here. So this small part for Denmark here, the statistics Denmark, they provide data for 117 or 30 different industries. And then Netherlands, they do the same year, Spain do the same year, and all the other countries in the world do the same. And they tell us which products are being produced by which industries. 
And down here, it's a use table. That's also something they publish. They tell us which products are used by each industry. Then we can put some emissions and we can think the whole thing together and we have a nice LCA model. So that is basically how we are constructing data. But then the question is, such a model, how big is it? And that's where I want to give a little piece of information on level one. I think we are still uh, missing these guys out. So I have tried to make this calculation. Um, every well, we have 2,000 products. Uh, we have both industries and we have markets. Um, and we have uh, 55 different countries. And we have yeah industries and markets, so we are adding up. Uh, so I can count how many columns do we have in this model here and how many rows do we have. Uh, and then I took a ruler and I was uh, measuring in Excel on my screen what is the height of a cell and width of a cell in Excel. And I was multiplying up uh, how big would the model be or is the model uh, I'm showing here. Um, and I have compared with uh, football rings. So uh, how big do you think it is? Well, it's like this. So imagine that you are having an Excel sheet and you are scrolling throughout 730 football lanes. So you need to have a good technique of finding the correct column and row if it's a specific number you're looking at. How are we then dealing with these big models? Uh, and, and sorry, now we are going to a level four, so you can uh, have a small nap if you like. First of all, we are making what we call a hybrid database. So we are taking these data from statistical offices on monetary accounts for every country, and we are combining these with physical data. So we are having very, very detailed physical data on what is the feed requirement of a cow when it's producing milk, which kind of feed is the cow using, and which kind of manure management system is it? Does it have, and we are creating nitrogen balances for the cow and for the crops and for the new treatment, et cetera. And we are combining and putting all this together with the monetary accounts. So we're having a very, very complete model and a very, very detailed model at the same time. That is one of the advantages. Another advantage, I have already told you about these market mixes, and average and marginal markets. That's what we're doing here in the market mixes. So we are composing consequential market mixes. So we are, for every market, we take into account what happens if we change the demand for something, and how are we then influencing different suppliers in different countries and with different technologies. Further, we are taking into account whenever we have a byproduct. What you see here in the top over here is that everything on the diagonal, that's main products. If you have a milk producer, milk is the main product. If you are having a, a district heat producer, district heat is the main product. For the milk, beef is a byproduct, and for the district heating, electricity could be a byproduct. So the byproducts, they are off the diagonal here. So what are we doing with the byproducts? We are simply having a byproduct, and if you take the byproduct and you put it as an input with a negative sign, then you are doing substitution, which is the solution and how you avoid allocation. So we do like that, and then we do it on the 730 football lanes just in one go. And we just do like this here. We take all these off diagonals here, we move them down with a negative sign as inputs of markets, and uh, we have not one single allocation in the database. What we are also doing is that we are uh, expanding the way that we are doing our LCA calculations. The traditional LCA calculation, that's this small matrix operation here. It looks super small, but it, in principle, this A here is actually the 730 football lanes. So you should not uh, be mistaken. Just a small letter can easily be a, a big model. Uh, but that's the small matrix operation that is done traditionally. Uh, this operation, it's a unidirectional from emissions to impact, and there's not really any options for having feedbacks. In a few seconds, you will hopefully understand what I'm talking about. So what we are doing is that we are expanding this awkward system that is traditionally used, 
And we are using a system like I'm illustrating here. I will show how it works in a few seconds. We are creating a so-called expanded system. And this expanded system uh, is where we have up here, we have the entire economy and how industries are producing and using products. Down here, we have the emissions from the industries. Over here, we have what is going on in the environment. Once you have an emission in the environment, then something happens before you have dead orangutans. And maybe you can have a feedback to economy up here. So that's what we're doing. So before up in the old system, there's not really a clear border between what is an impact and what is something you think is an impact. That is specifically done here because we put only empiric data in the top here. And then all these normative decision on what is actually important, what is an impact, that's something you can take down here in the impact factors. We can also deal with multi-directional flows. So when you have a CO2 emission, we can have CO2 emissions that cause warming, and this warming will maybe melt some permafrost, and permafrost will then again lead to more CO2. So you have actually some loops in the environment. That's something we can take into account. We can also do a very specific and clear impact pathway uh, modeling, and we can have feedback to economy. And I'll show a few examples. So here we could have here we have the emissions is just to show where they are and we have the impact pathways. Impact pathways is what is happening with an emission after. What, what are the impacts the emissions is causing? Then imagine this row here. Here we have some CO2 emissions. And the CO2 emissions, they are taken up by the atmosphere. We are using the atmosphere as a waste bin. So that is this column here is a kind of atmospheric waste bin. So it's CO2 assimilation. What happens when the atmosphere is taking up CO2? Then the atmosphere is causing radiative forcing. So we are putting more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, so more net energy will be kept at the Earth's surface. So we have some radiative forcing. There's more energy into the Earth. And this radiative forcing is then taken up again by the atmosphere. And what is happening then? Then this more energy to the Earth's surface calls for some temperature changes, and we will have some temperature changes here. And when we have temperature changes, we can have reduced crop yields. So if you are looking at crop yields in many countries well this summer because of major droughts, you will see that the yields have gone down. And that's because of CO2 emissions. So we actually have activities in economy that cause emissions. Then we have a pathway here that feeds back into economy. So we are having less crop yields today because of historical CO2 emissions. That is one thing we are modeling. Earlier, I've been talking about land use changes that can also be dealt with in this framework okay. here. Imagine that we have some crop cultivation. This column here, it represents a farm. It could be the rapeseed farm yeah, I was presenting earlier. Such a farm, it uses some land. So we are asking for some market for land. When we need land, I showed that this market for land, it would need input of intensification and some deforestation down here. When we have intensification, what happens then? Intensification, it was something about adding more fertilizers and it will also cause more emissions. And when we have deforestation here, the deforestation will also cause more emissions. So everything we are dealing with is actually fitting in, in this expanded system here. And hopefully in the future that will enable us to understand better how the environmental mechanisms they are functioning. And not at least to understand them and how to model them in an LCA framework. Okay, now I've reached to the point with a few concluding remarks. Well, Looking at the environmental problems, there are many solutions. Some of the solutions, they are good ones. There were a few about the cars. The electric one was a good one. There are some less good that could be the uh, eco efficiency of materials for the car, because that was not really making a big difference. And then there are some actually which we could not call solutions that could be the biodiesel. 
which is actually making everything even worse. And my point here is that it is a disaster to make wrong decisions. Some decisions within my stories here may be wrong. I will not make a general statement of which specific decisions are wrong, but they could definitely have been better, these decisions on the topic, topics I've been telling stories about. We are having urgency. There are some major problems. If we are not going to end with a seven degree increase in temperatures, we need to solve the problems now. So we cannot waste time and resources on wrong decisions. Imagine what the EU Commission has spent several, I don't know, how many, many, many man years on putting together a legislation on a ban on plastics, single use plastics. So now we cannot buy plastic bags and we cannot buy cotton pads with a plastic stick and we cannot buy plastic straws. It is the proportions here, they are completely out of scope. So we are spending all our human resources and our right brains on solving something that is way too small. We are completely forgetting about the elephant. How do we then navigate? What is the solution? First of all, take a look at, look at the proportions. If the EU Commission had taken a look at this plastic, they would very, very fast find out, okay, plastics, you, it's not a big problem. We have other problems which are much bigger. So a bit of common sense, maybe an LCA, not necessarily. Sometimes you can actually just do some proper thinking on doing some statistics and you will find out, okay, you don't need to look further into that. We should do something else. Once you have the proportions right, then you need what to do. Then you need to get the results right. So we have the cars. What should we do? There's a lot of solutions. So we need, first of all, to think hard because I have illustrated it's not necessarily easy to do an LCA that creates meaningful results. You need to do some hard thinking. There's no way around it. And then an LCA. And of course, an LCA is not an LCA. You need to use the right methods, meaningful methods. And finally, when you do that, you will have the decisions right. And we can reach at one of the better IPCC scenarios, which I was showing on the first slide. So with that, I would like to say thanks of all of you, to all of you, and thank you for listening. A few minutes left where we have uh, set aside some time for questions. Uh, so if anyone in the room here has a question, please raise your hand. Uh, we have decided to keep all the online attendees muted, so there's an option for them to ask questions, <laughs> but they can feel free to write a question in the comment field uh, in Teams, and then uh, I will see what I can do about answering these questions at a later point in time. So it was not that hard at all. Okay. Yes, Mikhail, please go ahead. Okay, so if there is no question, I take the opportunity to ask you this question. So uh, despite I fully agree on everything you have said, uh, I still uh, struggle uh, to understand how we revert uh, this situation. Because unfortunately, the European Union uh, has quite strong voice. And they are still working on PEF and they are still demanding PEF, and people want to do PEF because the European Union is asking for it. How do we change this? Well, I think it will not be a one time fix. Uh, you need to slowly work to more a, a more correct situation. The first thing I would do was to really erase all these sector specific guidance. And then I would have one common guide for all sectors, because I showed that animal feed, it may actually be present in several different sectors. So it doesn't need to have different guidelines for the same material in different sector guidance. So the only thing you should have in the sector guidance could be guidance on how to define a functional unit, where to find data. And then the second thing that would be needed 
would be to have a common database and really, I mean, not just a common methodology, but even a common model. So since since long time ago, I've been working with sector specific models, both in within the dairy system and within the uh, beef and within pig production systems, uh, palm oil production systems. And when you have established such a model and you make the, you make the pig model, that should be complying. It draws on the same background database as the milk model, palm oil model. And then you open up, let's say for the uh, milk producers, so that they can put data in the model. And then everyone, every farmer will have calculated their footprint in a uniform way. It's the only way that you can avoid a situation like where I have tried to do a PEF compliant LCA and fix, and some Swedish guys have tried the same, and we are 100% off. So we need to have a common model. And of course, you can, you can open up for having different models. So if there's a specific desire for some attribution results for some specific reasons, you can always do that. But you, you, you are not stuck in such a model to produce only one set of results. You should have flexibility and transparency and have common methods in, in models. Other questions? Yes? What was so wrong with the unit testing? The only thing is that there's been put, well, it's not wrong to do something about as there are, there are something wrong because Right now, I'm put my use of straws, they pollute more than all the yeah. one thing. But, and actually also my use of plastic bags, I've swapped to paper bags and they are polluting more than the plastic bags. So I'm, I'm polluting more. So, uh, and they have, and the thing is that, let's imagine I'm, I'm going shopping now. Uh, let's say I take my car, let's say I drive 10 kilometers and we have the car LCA at the top. So 10 kilometer, I emit 1.3 kilo, uh, kilograms of CO2. No, I need to go back 2.6 or 7, 2.7 kilogram of CO2 from my shopping trip. I can get really, really a lot of plastic bags for 2.7 kilograms of CO2. And then not even thinking about what is in the bags. So the plastic issue related to one shopping trip is really the smallest things. It's just because it's something you people see and when they can see it they think it's a problem but it's like uh, yeah it's like the elephant in the room is completely transparent sometimes you need to to yeah to focus on the elephant sometimes also yes that's a question on there to what extent are the models linear like from your early part of the talk i heard that for every plastic bag we don't use we use a paper bag yeah and so the, the demand is inelastic and the products are directly bundled and that works fine in a marginal model where you're very close to the same set. Mm -hmm. But if a lot of people stop using bags entirely, you end up with a different set point, with different marginal values. So to what extent is your new model dealing with those kinds of non-linearities? You're right that when we are dealing with a marginal model like this year, uh, we are typically, uh, we say that our models, they are valid from now and then five, 10 years into the future. Not always 10, because there are some markets that are really vulnerable and it's hard to predict what is going to happen. But we can definitely say something about which suppliers are most likely to respond to changes in demand today. So, so the models, they are completely linear, but they need to be updated because the marginal mix today may not be the same as the marginal mix in five years. So we, in order to have a fully functional model, it needs to be updated, maybe on an annual basis, but at least at a relatively uh, uh, desirable interval. And that is also what we're doing here in the Getting the Data Right project, where we are establishing uh, uh, direct links APIs to, uh, to statistical data, so we are able to populate the model with uh, data all the 730 football lanes will be automatically populated every year with data. There's a question here in the bottom as well. Thanks again. I just have a general question. 
how how we uh, how how we can hide the temperature and like ranking between zero to one hundred. How come we can hide actually to reach the two degree temperature increase? Yeah, that's a super good question. So how likely is it actually that we can in in some of the nicer uh, scenarios of the IPCC? Uh, if we were going two years back in time, I was really pessimistic. Uh, at that time, I could not really see how can we make steel without a lot of energy? How can we make aluminium? How can we do anything without emitting a lot? But then I've been uh, started uh, with a large project uh, working for some of the largest uh, shipping companies in the world. Uh, how to find a uh, alternative to uh, current uh, heavy fuel oil for ship uh, for shipping and some of the technologies and pathways we are investigating they actually end up showing net negative co2 emissions and that's as long as we can identify some residues or some wastes which are currently today are used in a bad way it could be uh, crop residues in agriculture they are largely just left in the field and they just uh, decay, so they rotten up and become CO2 within, on average, less than a year. If instead you can uh, send this uh, through a pyrolysis, you can stabilize some of the uh, carbon there. Let's say you stabilize half of the carbon and the rest is produced into pyrolysis oil, so you can use that as a shipping oil or whatever fuel. And then what is stabilized, you put that into the field instead. So instead of having a huge CO2 emission every year from the crops, which are just decaying, you can actually accumulate carbon in, in the soil in, in that way. Um, and that's, that's, that was just one example, but there's a, there's a lot of opportunities within the field of power to X, which uh, shows some really promising technologies. Also within uh, food production, there are some really promising technologies. Uh, how to reduce uh, emissions and how to increase efficiencies. So today I'm actually a bit more uh, optimistic. Great. Seems like uh, there are no more questions. So if there are no more questions, please help me to just uh, once more say thank you, Suyanik, for a great presentation. Now we'd like to invite you to join us for a small reception uh, to continue the celebration. So please come with us outside and help us celebrate them a little bit more. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>